How about you? Maybe for you millennials, it's traveling the world, capturing those perfect Insta shots that everybody else seems to post. Or maybe for you country music fans, it's a little bit of chicken fry, a cold beer on a Friday night, a pair of jeans that fit just right, and the radio on. Or maybe if Frank Sinatra is more your style, it's having the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow because you're in love. What does the good life look like? What does it mean to be blessed? That's what we're going to be exploring for the next couple of weeks in this sermon series called The Good Life, as we look at Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And I think this is a really important question for us to be thinking about as we move into November and as we get ready for the Thanksgiving season. What are we grateful for? And what does that say about what we believe it means to be blessed? Does what we believe match up with what Jesus actually says? Today we're going to see that the answer might surprise you. In our passage for today, Jesus describes the kind of people that he calls blessed. And honestly, I'm not so sure how many of us want to be those kind of people. Jesus takes the good life, and he says that in his kingdom, the good life looks pretty upside down compared to what we're used to. Instead of the haves, it's the have-nots that are actually better off. It's the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the humbled, the people hungering and thirsting for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted. It's actually the most needy who Jesus declares are blessed. And so this morning, I want to share three reasons why that's actually really good news for us. And the first reason that that's good news is because the good life that we usually think of isn't really that great. That's your first fill-in-the-blank if you're the fill-in-the-blank kind of people. The good life isn't really that great. See, every single person here wants the good life. We all long for it. There's something in us that's constantly striving to experience something better or to make things better. There's something in us that knows that this world and our experience in it isn't as good as it should be. And that's because we were created for God's version of the good life. We see that in Genesis 1 and 2, where God slowly and artistically created the universe. And every time he adds something to it, he looks at it and he says, that's good. And after making human beings in his image, it says God blessed them. And part of that blessing was charging them with the work of discovering and unleashing the untapped potential and beauty that he built into the world so that we would get to discover over and over again how awesome and amazing he is through his creation. He invited Adam and Eve to fill and subdue the earth, not so that we could use it and abuse it, but to use the gifts and the talents that he gave them to make it so that everything flourished. And humans got to join God in making the world an even better place every day for everyone. And by the end of all that creating, God stopped. And he declared it very good. See, maximizing the good life in a good world with our good God is what you were created for. That's your natural habitat. That's where you would be free to fulfill your potential and experience the good life that we long for. But that's not really our reality, is it? So what happened? Adam and Eve chose to look to something that God created for them to give them a better life. The one tree that they weren't allowed to eat from. Instead of trusting that God was already giving them what was best for them. They tried to fill God's place in their life with something he created. And they found that it failed miserably. Instead of a better life, they experienced shame and isolation. Broken relationships and fear, and ultimately death. And Romans 1 summarizes the rest of the story. It says that even though God created our world to point us to him by showing us how awesome and amazing and creative he is, the more we learn about it, we all, since Adam and Eve, have stopped letting the goodness of the world around us inspire us to worship God. And instead, we choose to worship the good things that we see themselves. Every day, we push God out of the picture, and we choose to trust in something that he created to give us the good life that we long for, instead of looking to him. And that's called idolatry. Yeah, we have a worship problem around here. We are all a bunch of idol worshipers. Do you not think that that applies to you? Let me ask you this. Is there any shame in your life? Or fear? Are there broken relationships? If so, then there was probably some idol worship that led to that. 
just like there was for Adam and Eve. And don't worry, this is a, well, not don't worry, but this is a universal condition, so you're not alone. In fact, John Calvin actually said that the nature of the human heart is that it is a perpetual idol factory. We're always tempted to take something good and make it something ultimate. And we can tell when we've taken a created thing and turned it into an idol by asking some questions. What is it that your life rises and falls upon? What makes or breaks your day? Is it being recognized or praised at work? Are you crushed when somebody criticizes you? What keeps you up at night? Or what's that thing that if you just had that, then you'd finally be happy? Is it a relationship? A fitter body? A house? A baby? A better paying job? Retirement? A permanent vacation on a warm beach in Mexico? What are you looking to for significance or acceptance, satisfaction or fulfillment or joy? That thing is your idol. Is it your bank account? Is it alcohol? Is it Netflix binges at 9 o'clock when your kids are finally in bed? Is that what your day looks up to? <laughs> is it the approval of others to the point that you can't say no to anybody? In other words, what are you looking to to give you the good life? What was that first thing that popped into your head when you first heard the words the good life? If it didn't involve Jesus, then it just might be an idol. I mean, mine definitely was. And let me ask you, how is worshiping these idols working out for you? Have they given you what you wanted yet? Or do you still need something else? And what's the fruit or what's the result that you're seeing in your life? Is it more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness? Or is it shame and fear, anxiety and discontentment, isolation? See, the things that we look to for the good life, if they're just created things, really aren't that great. Because those things were never meant to give us the good life. The good life is only really possible when we spend our days worshiping the giver of all good things, God. So the first reason the Beatitudes are good news is because they remind us that what we call the good life usually isn't actually that great. The second reason the Beatitudes are good news is because Jesus shows us that the needy are actually the ones who are better off. The needy are better off. That's your second fill in the blank. Now, what do I mean by that? Do I mean that you should sell everything and go live on the streets? No, I'm not telling you to do that. The Holy Spirit might tell you to do that, and then you should probably do it, but I'm not telling you to do that. What I'm saying is that the list of people that Jesus calls blessed here are all incredibly needy. Take a look. First, there's the poor in spirit. By definition, they are needy. They're poor. Whether they're economically poor, like in Luke's version of the Beatitudes, or spiritually poor, like they are here, um, they're incredibly needy. Dallas Willard translates this group of people as spiritual zeros. They don't have anything to bring to the table when it comes to their relationship with God. Second, Jesus includes those who mourn. Someone who's mourning isn't just sad. They feel like they just had something ripped from them. Like, they, they feel like a part of their life is missing. Like, they need that person or that thing, or else they'll never be able to feel whole or experience joy again. They desperately need something. How about the meek? Now, we like to think that being meek is a good character trait because being meek means humble, right? And, and usually humility is a good thing. But James Bryan Smith, in his book, The Good and Beautiful Life, which if this sermon series interests you, I highly recommend reading it, he says that the meaning of this word meek actually comes from the Aramaic word praus, which means something more like defenseless. So the meek aren't humble people, they're humbled people. People who can't fight back or resist the people that are taking advantage of them. They desperately need a defender or an advocate. Next, Jesus brings up those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And man, that is a powerful image of a need, isn't it? This doesn't just mean they want righteousness. They're starving for it. They need whatever injustice they're in the middle of to be made right, or else they're going to die. Their need for justice is as real and necessary as eating or drinking. And how about the merciful? Again, this is a pretty positive trait, so we read this and we usually say, oh, man, I should really be more merciful. But that's missing the point. Even the merciful are incredibly needy. When a person is merciful, they're opening themselves up to being taken advantage of. 
Their need is for the person that they were merciful to not walk all over them. We admire somebody's mercy until they're taken advantage of. And then we think they'd be an idiot if they'd ever do it again. And this is describing somebody who's made that kind of mercy their lifestyle. That's a pretty needy person. And then there are the peacemakers. Can you guess what they need? Peace, right? Peacemakers are those who willingly walk into conflict at immense risk to themselves. If they don't get peace quickly, then they're going to stay stuck in the middle of a potentially harmful situation. Again, this is a position of need, even if it's a positive trait. And finally, there's those people who are persecuted for Jesus' sake. What they need is an end to their persecution. Or even better yet, they need hope in the middle of their persecution in order to keep going through it. You don't make it through persecution without something powerful to hope in. So all these people Jesus has just used to describe the kind of person the kingdom of heaven belongs to are incredibly needy. But why does that make them better off? And what does that have to do with us? Jesus says that they're all better off because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. First of all, they're invited in. These kinds of people are the ones who are used to being rejected and excluded from the kingdom of heaven. The Jews of Jesus' day thought that the kingdom of heaven belonged to healthy, wealthy, morally upstanding Jewish men. After all, those were the people experiencing the good life, right? So Jesus must be blessing them. They're the blessed people. But Jesus turns that absolutely upside down and says that those who have nothing to bring to the table, those who feel abandoned by God because of loss, those who can't help themselves, those who are desperate for justice to be done, those who are always getting in the middle of things, and those who the religious leaders are persecuting because they're open to the crazy teachings of this guy named Jesus, those are the people who are actually blessed because they're finally invited into the kingdom. It's even for them. But it's not just even for them. It's actually only for people like them. Jesus is saying here that the kingdom of heaven is only for people who see how desperately needy they actually are. Think about it. Jesus is saying that the way to experience the good life isn't to make sure you're never needy. It's to recognize how needy you are. Heaven and Jesus' kingdom here on earth aren't going to be filled with good people who have done good things and who don't really need anything else. It's not going to be filled with good people who have lived the good life and who know all the right things and who deserve to get into heaven. Jesus is saying heaven is going to be filled with people who know how desperately needy they are, those who have nothing to bring to the table, those who need somebody to stand up for them, whose only hope is in something other than themselves in their situation. They are blessed. They're better off because they're the kind of people who can actually get into the kingdom of heaven. They're the ones who want a new kingdom. They're the ones who know they need a new kingdom. They've realized that the kingdoms that they're living in aren't even close to the good life that they long for. They need something better. And that's great news because that means we can get into the kingdom. Because guess what? Whether you know it or not, you are a desperately needy person too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be chasing after the good life in all the ways that you do. We're all needy. We're desperate to know that we are loved and lovable. We're desperate to finally feel secure in ourselves. We're desperate to know that we're good enough, desperate to be desired, desperate for rest, desperate for healing, desperate to not have to worry anymore. We are all desperately needy, and that's actually a gift from God. Because now, instead of God's amazing creation driving us to him, it's our needs that are going to drive us into his kingdom. That's partly why the desperately needy people Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes are better off. Because they know they need something better. They've seen how awful their idols were at giving them what they longed for. And, and now their need can do what God has always intended it to. It can drive them to Jesus. It's only when we finally realize how desperately needy we are that we'll be, able to, or that we'll be open to something or someone better. And that's the third reason why the Beatitudes are good news. Because Jesus' life is better. Jesus' life is the best. That's your third fill in the blank. Jesus' life in the place of yours is better than whatever version of the good life you're currently worshiping. That's the good news. The needy people Jesus called, calls blessed aren't better off because they're needy. They're better off because Jesus came to invite them into his life so that he could meet their deepest needs. And Jesus is the answer to every need. You can trust Jesus more than your bank account. 
Because in his life, Jesus became poor for you, not having a place to lay his head. And on the cross, Jesus took on your spiritual poverty. He became a spiritual zero so that you could have access to the full resources of the kingdom of heaven. If God didn't even spare Jesus but gave him up for us, how will he not also give us all things? In Jesus, you have full access to God as your father who longs to give you exactly what you need and more. How does your bank account look in comparison? Jesus is better comfort than any friend or lost loved one because he knows what it means to mourn. He wept over the loss of his friends, and he lost everything for you on the cross so that you'll never have to lose anything or mourn ever again. He took away the sting of death when he rose again, and now he's waiting in heaven to wipe away every tear from your eyes. And if you're in Jesus, his spirit, who knows you better than anything, anybody else, is always with you. You are never truly alone. And you are never empty. The fullness of God dwells in you. How can any person live up to that? Jesus is a better advocate than any group or government for anybody who feels defenseless and unable to fight back. Because Jesus became defenseless on the cross, refusing to fight back for your sake so that he could constantly advocate for exactly what you need right now in front of his Father, the greatest authority in the universe. The God of the universe is fighting for you. Who do you have to be afraid of? I could go on and on. Jesus' perfect life in place of ours, his death that paid for our sins, his resurrection that defeated sin, death, and the devil, his ascension to heaven to advocate for us, and his spirit living his life through us, are the answer to every need that we can experience. Jesus is better. Let me do one more comparison. The idol that I worship for my good life. My responsibility-free, all-inclusive beach life in Mexico. See, the reason I idolize that is because I want to escape from the responsibilities that I have around me. Deep down, what I'm really idolizing is myself. I want to constantly be seen as ideal, and present this perfect image to everybody. And every responsibility that I have has the potential to show people that I am less than perfect. And deep down, I'm terrified that if people see me as less than perfect, if they see that I am less than perfect, they'll reject me, and I'll get hurt. And that terrifies me. So my idol is a permanent vacation from all responsibility, because somehow that will let me avoid feeling any pain or ever disappointing anybody, right? Obviously, that's not true. And obviously, there's something better. There's a better way to do it. And I don't usually look to Jesus as better, but here's why Jesus is so much better than my idol. First of all, Jesus offers a way better rest. I think that I want to rest from my responsibilities. I just need a vacation. But Jesus knows what I really need is rest from my fear. And he's already dealt with that. I don't have to be afraid of not living up to my responsibilities. And I don't have to keep up a perfect image because Jesus has already lived a perfect life for me. When God looks at me on my worst day at work or my worst day as a dad, he looks at me with as much love and approval as he looks at Jesus, who's sitting right next to him reminding him that Jesus already paid the, paid the price for the pain of my failures. That, and he did that on the cross. See, I don't have to earn any, any approval from God. He looks at me already, no matter what, with more love than I look at my two kids. And there is nothing I can do to make him love me any more or any less. Instead, now he's taking every moment of my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and he's using all of it to live Jesus' life through me. He's using every moment to grow me up into someone more like him and to show all the people around me that I know how amazing he is, that he can take somebody like me and love me into a Christ-like life. And the only way that I will ever truly live the good life that I'm longing for isn't by res escaping the responsibilities God's given me. It's by preaching the gospel of what God has already done for me to myself over and over again until it sinks all the way in. God is awesome. And what he's done for us in Jesus is the only way into the good life. Because his gospel is the only thing that can drive us back to worshiping him just like he deserves. When we apply the gospel to our lives, we start to see our own idols. We see how desperately needy we really are. And we're reminded again that the best life we can live is one fully dependent on the better life of Jesus for us. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, 
Lord, we do believe this. Help our unbelief. Father, this week I pray that your spirit would convict us whenever we start worshiping something other than you. I pray that we'd see the idols in our lives for what they are. Things that were created and things that can never give us the good life because they were never meant to give us the good life. They were meant to point us to you. And Father, I'm afraid to ask this, but I pray that you would show us how needy we are this week and that you would frustrate the ways that we try to protect ourselves from needing you. And instead, I pray that you'd show us over and over again how much better Jesus is. Help us to experience the power of the gospel so that we can have transformed lives by the renewing of our minds. Help us to preach the gospel to ourselves and to each other over and over again this week until we can worship you with our whole lives and start to experience the good life you've made available for us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as the ushers come forward.